Bahia Shehab, you are an artist, art historian, professor of design, and founder of the graphic design program at the American University in Cairo. You are the author of At the Corner of a Dream, A Journey of Resistance and Revolution, published in 2019 and uh, also the author of You Can Crush the Flowers, a visual memoir of the Egyptian Revolution in 2021. And I invited you to participate in this panel to discuss your research work and your award-winning book entitled A History of Arab Graphic Design that you co-wrote with Haysam Nawal and published by the American University in Cairo Press in 2020. Um, with over 600 color images, your book talks about the development of graphic design in the MENA region from Morocco to Iraq, covering a period of more than one century. Uh, you know, I have been moderating uh, many interviews and for the first time, we're not talking about art, but graphic design in the Arab world. So a very simple question to you uh, to start this conversation. What is the difference between art and graphic design. Thank you for this question. It's a, it's a question that many of our students ask us actually before uh, declaring a major when they come for advising. Um, I think the, if, if I'm to state a basic difference is that uh, art is more of an expression. It's, um, it's a personal expression. You are not committed to necessarily a client, you are not linked to a, a specific outcome. It's more of a personal exploration, personal questions. While design is more of a collaborative effort, it involves more the com of the community. It has, there's a somebody that you are designing with or designing for, um, and there it needs to communicate. So whatever you're designing has a utility, whether it's a logo or, um, an information design whatever is it that you are designing needs to communicate so clarity is important communication is important so um if art was an a form of an emotional conceptual form of communication that is more personal design is um a more um concrete physical form of communication uh, and is there any specific methodology to work on uh, graphic art? Uh, why do you think it, it's uh, important, work, important to work on this uh, discipline as much as art history? I, I love the fact that you said graphic art because this is actually my answer to you. This is the beginning of the field. So in the beginning of the field, so we're talking about um, um, in the early 20th century, uh, post-World Wars, when there were uh, uh, actually the development of the design discipline or the need of, for the design discipline to emerge. In our part of the world, in the Arab world, you had two kinds of people contributing to the visual formation. These were artists because they could create visuals and calligraphers because they could create text. And design is basically, in, the, in its early form, is text and image. So, um, and this is what you needed to communicate. And it's the marriage between these two basic forms that is actually now part of, and a big part of what des uh, design is. And something that is not necessarily uh, relevant to art. Art does not need to have text, but almost 99% of what we design has typography. Uh, you just mentioned uh, so calligraphy. Uh, in the introduction of your book, you wrote, and I quote, a knowledge of Islamic visual heritage is a key to understand and discuss modern Arab graphic design. Um, how the traditional Arabic calligraphy was used by modern calligraphers in the beginning of the 20th century. Well, there we had we have listed key figures who we have um, found uh, here. You're using Omar Rasim as one of the beautiful examples, actually, and I love these examples. You picked one of uh, some of my favorites. Uh, I love the fact that this is a purely commercial um, communication. It's um, um, 
an advertisement for Shell. Actually, this is a part of a calendar because it says Kul Amu Antum Bikhair, and 1964, and the Shell logo. So it's communicating Happy New Year, the Shell logo, and the year. But everything else around it, it says Islamic art. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the way uh, Omar Rasim combined these, this, for this communication with these visuals that you would usually find on a Quranic manuscript or an illustrated Islamic manuscript, this marriage that the designer started creating, taking from the religious uh, visuals to the more um, commercial or vernacular um, forms of communication that were needed like the street sign that you have here that was designed by Said Ibrahim so I love the fact that we have Omar Rasim and Said Ibrahim two calligraphers who were not necessarily in the same country but in the same region but also who have produced work that is to similar similar kinds of crimes so they both created street signs they both create both created advertisements for different things they both created logos and different forms of communication because there was a need they had the skill to do it and they were um uh, being productive in a period uh, that needed their talent so i love this comparison and i'm glad that you've highlighted their work here and you can see the the spectrum that they've worked with from creating emblems for um kulthum or a logo for um kulthum to creating an uh, a tv uh, or a cinema or a film announcement uh, and these calligraphers were scribing everything from street street signs. But why? Because there was a need, there was a demand for this, and this was pre-computer, and the calligraphers were stepping in to supply for that demand. Um, what was the reception of the local audience seeing this uh, traditional uh, Arab calligraphy adapted into an, the modern time? I don't think I have an answer to how their reaction was. I, um, I don't think our research uh, was able to to look into that. But I, I think the things that would strike any audience is the technology. Uh, for example, when they introduced, uh, let's say, uh, the TV or when they introduced color printing into magazines or when they introduced the printing of photography into newspapers. These are striking things for the audience when there is a new technological um, when there's a technological evolution that is also and this is what's beautiful about design. It's always linked to te technology. It's always evolving and moving um with the advancement of technology so i would think they would be interested i mean it would be exciting to see the first for example colored street billboard or the first organized signage street names in cairo i think these would be key moments uh, for the audience because they would see the shift historians always love transitions and transitions most of the time come with technological advancements so i think the audience and this is just a, a guess from noticing the evolution of things. I think whenever there was a technological evolution, design was always at the forefront in presenting that to the audience. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, there was a need um, during the 19th century industrial revolution, the capitalist market spread in the countries of the Arab world, responding to consumers' uh, needs. Uh, you wrote the skills needed to develop a printed advertisement were roughly similar to the skills needed to be a designer. Um, here we have uh, three examples uh, from your book of uh, advertisement. Can you explain us what was, what was the required work? Um, so, as again, two things here that you can clearly see them. You have image and text. Yeah. So I think photo collage or photo montage in, in this case, cutting a certain image and creating the composition, looking at the layout, like the decision to put the, the tube, the, the actual product. So you always see the product. And uh, in, in this case, the, these are three celebrity endorsements. So Sabah as a local, uh, 
And um, of course, Saad Zaghloul endorsing uh, Nabulsi, um, the soap. So these are celebrity endorsements of products that were being promoted at the time. So you have a well-balanced classical text. I wouldn't say it's the typographic, so it's calligraphic. So these were basic calligraphic text combined um, uh, with a photo collaged image that is cut out and placed in the layout. And then the layout, the hierarchy of information, this is also the role of designer, is to design where the headline goes, where the subheadline goes, where is where the fine text goes. Um, how do you combine uh, image and text overall. Uh, for example, here we have the figure Zad Zaghloul. What do you think it was interesting to connect? These but uh, yeah, it's the 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 thing is with with uh, Nabulsi, and actually this is the topic of my next book. I'm working on the uh, evolution of advertising in Egypt. Uh, so hopefully. Um, I will be focusing more on this area and analyzing more what was going on in terms of um, uh, communication evolution. Um, but it's always this celebrity endorsement. If we look at the time, uh, the year is unknown, but obviously with the political movement before that, also the, uh, the, the soap was endorsing the king. So they're always, it's a brand that, that has political endorsement. Unlike, for example, uh, other uh, brands like the one where Sabah has featured, this one would, we, would feature more um, stars, celebrities, actresses. Nab with Nabulsi, they were getting endorsements from royalty and from political figures. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll just comment on the, why it's difficult to date this ad because it, it's it, if you read the fine print in the ad, it says, So he had already passed away. So we cannot really tell the date. So after the demise of the Ottoman Empire and the establishment of the European colonial powers in the Middle East, the publishing industry developed in the Arab countries, especially to communicate on bureaucratic decisions and political news, and Egypt and Lebanon became uh, leaders in this uh, industry. We have here so a picture of the first issue of Al Ahram, Egyptian newspaper in uh, 1876, and the second picture is the first issue of Fatat Lubnan, which is the first magazine published by a woman uh, Salim Abi Rashid in 1914. Yes, so this is first documented. We always say first documented until we someone else comes and maybe finds something older. So this is the first documented um, uh, magazine. Uh, and what's what's really interesting is the how the audience is clear and how um, the illustrations are represented and how the calligraphy is is represented on on the covers of these layout and it's very clear that with the ahram newspaper you can see from the logo and the layout this is a governmental um communication it's dense it has a lot of information it has serious information the other the other um, um magazine is more is targeted at younger women and it says adabiya almiya riwaiya so it had um a collection of um, of articles. So what was interesting is that Lebanon, in terms of publishing, always had uh, was um, a step ahead de Levant. I don't want to say just Lebanon because this would be Lebanon, Syria, but also Iraq. So um, the, the and these countries, the reason why publishing publishing started in these countries before others um, is actually because of um, uh, missionaries. Uh, there were um, setups, limited uh, printing uh, setups in monasteries uh, in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, uh, who were uh, importing this technology from Europe that was not uh, available uh, for the rest of the Islamic world uh, for different political reasons. I mean, we go into depth uh, in that in our uh, in our book, um, where we discuss possible scenarios of why publishing was delayed for the Arab world and the reason why printing, the printing presses, I don't mean publishing um, as in dissemination of knowledge, but the printing press, let's say, 
um, uh, Gutenberg's printing press, the technology of the printing press did not disseminate in the Arab world for different reasons. But there were other forms of printing technologies that we have very good scholars now uh, researching more in depth. But um, you can see that especially in type design till today, uh, the leading figures in the field are actually Lebanese. And this is not because there's more talent uh, uh, there, but actually the technology was older there. So you had more of the background of the sensitivity of the knowledge of that that was transmitted more in that part of the world than the rest of the Arab world. And this is, I mean, to me, one of the reasons why today most of the well-established type designers in the field are actually Lebanese. And how was the print media was uh, distributed back then? Uh, the distribution, you mean physical distribution? distribution yeah. um, so depending, depending on the price and on the, on the uh, audience. So you can see that many of them had subscriptions for abroad. Yeah. And they and they had the prices in francs and in uh, real and so uh, this clearly tells you we had good working mailing systems probably remaining from the Ottoman Empire, um, and uh, it's it's always interesting to see the prices because they listed prices for. Um, uh, different Arab countries, so it had the currencies of the different Arab countries, and it also had, had currencies for either the US or a country in Europe, probably Europe. where it, the audience who bought this magazine also lived. So these some of these magazines and newspapers were actually exported out of the Arab world, not just for Arab world consumption, which really speaks of how cosmopolitan uh, publishing was in the Arab world during that period. And how, how were you able to get access to these archives? So we were very lucky because the Ahram archive is fully available for us at the Rare Books Library at AUC. So we are very, very lucky. And um, the Rare Books Library has been acquiring uh, all of the important cultural magazines that have come out from specifically Egypt. So in that sense, we were lucky here. And for the archive for Lebanon and Syria, we used the American University in Beirut's archive. That was also very useful. Um, we talked about Egypt uh, and its uh, leading uh, position in, uh, in the publishing industry. Uh, uh, Egyptian cities like Cairo and Alexandria have always uh, been uh, cultural hubs uh, in the Arab world, in the fields of art, music, and cinema. We all know about the Egyptian uh, film industry, and uh, which have uh, which has influenced the culture in the Arab world uh, since it started growing. And you wrote in your book, I quote: "People were observing new ways of illustrating images and writing Arabic scripts." Uh, how the movie poster imposed itself as a uh, new visual reference? Uh, what, what's beautiful about post movie posters is that they are there for the public. They are film is because of its the nature of its consumption. It's for the masses. It's uh, it's something that is open to the public. Anybody can come visit and watch a movie. So. Um, it had to communicate with everyone and it had to also attract audience because you want more you want more revenue you want more people to to watch uh, the movie so um designers started looking at um um what attracted uh, obviously it's not just the poster that would attract but this is a step that would tell the people there's a, something new out but how do you summarize what the film is about? How do you communicate that with an audience that know, who knows nothing about the book? And at the same time, uh, increase um, um, attendance or visits, increase sales, uh, make the producers happy. So these are all uh, things that designers should take into, into mind. So you can see how they, start, they were becoming really extremely creative in the way they designed these uh, posters. 
Uh, and would you say the designers, the Egyptian designers, were inspired by maybe Hollywood movie posters? Or they had Thank this you very. For this question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, uh, of course, there's always influence, uh, but I would like to remind you that uh, Studio Masr is one of the oldest um, studios in the world. Uh, so it. it, it so so yeah so it it was attracting um and actually the people working uh with in the film industry were not only egyptian in the early days of cinema they, you had uh, greeks italians armenians um so you had people from the mediterranean basin more or less really invested in the image creation for for cinema so it was it was again a very cosmopolitan field uh, that influenced and got influenced by different uh, schools, whether Italian, Spanish, French, um, or um, American. So I wouldn't say that Hollywood was the only um, inspiration um, because of, of our proximity to Europe and because of the talent exchange that was there in the beginning of the cinema, uh, uh, industry, I would say there was an exchange um, from all all around, not just uh, Hollywood. And the designers, uh, the, let's say the local designers in Egypt, where where were uh, where did they train? So it's the, it's a multiplicity of uh, backgrounds. So some studied in the Funun uh, Gamila, the fine arts um, school. Uh, some uh, were many were self-taught because of the nature of the industry and because there were no design school and the design discipline per se did not exist. So a lot of these designers were also self-trained. Some of them would start off as calligraphers and then evolve into painting posters. And some would be training with already poster designers who would be their mentors and then they would be continuing the craft. So you had a different, they came from different uh, backgrounds. Um, the post uh, the post independence period marked uh, an important moment in the modern history of, uh, of the Arab countries. Can you tell us how the newly independent countries were affir affirming the specificity of their respective cultural and historical identity? So. We your we saw. About, sorry, your book is also about Arab modernity. Exactly, it's uh, and this was really for me the most interesting time and the most challenging time, but also uh, the most exciting time because you can visually see how designers were trying to find um, a visual for what the, their identity is. So in Egypt, the question was, who are we? Are we Muslims? Are we ancient Egyptians? Are we uh, Arabs? What, what is our identity? How do you navigate this identity? And how do you visually represent it? Um, what is the color of our flag? And what does it mean? What is our national anthem? Who are our uh, local uh, newspapers, TVs? What does their logo look like? What does it mean? Are we more European? Are we more Arab? Are we um, Phoenicians? Are we? <laughs> um, uh, so there was a really a, a look into the self, and this and this was a collective intellectual um, question. Uh, and design was just a visualization of these questions. So what designers were doing were translating, visually translating the, the, this question of identity. And you could see it in all the different arts during the same period. You, we saw it in poetry, saw it in cinema, we saw it in, um, um, in writings. And so it, it was design is one of is just one of these cultural manifestations of the of the search for identity during that period. And why would you say this was uh, the most exciting part of your 
where because i i have a i have a soft spot for pre-computer <laughs> artwork that was generated when the designers still use their hand and i feel like there was a lot of character in the lettering style and the because they had lettering they had calligraphy uh, they had their own illustration styles they collaborated with artists to create the artwork so there was more of a natural um feel of the experiment and then when with the advancement of computer we lost a lot and this is this is partly why our book stops at 2000 because we did not really want to uh, delve into because the minute the computer was developed and the minute we had the internet there was a a, a big shift in our visual language and how we are viewed and represented again there were also more design school who were graduating more design professional designers into the field so it was a completely different conversation and i think it needs a completely different book uh, this is why we we stopped at 2000 and you'll find a lot of the artwork that we documented was actually hand generated it's not computer generated and it has its own charm 